So, you wanna print really big stuff? A really tiny printer. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to my channel, my name is Frank, and today I wanna to take you guys through the process that I do to cut up really big 3D prints and fit them on almost any size printer. So, I've printed some pretty big stuff, and through this past year and a half, almost two years of printing, one of the biggest questions I get asked is, damn dude, how big is your printer? It's massive, it's gigantic. I can print a whole Iron Man suit in one shot. I'm kidding, of course I don't have a printer that big, but the people asking a lot of these questions don't know any better. And this video isn't to mock anybody, this video isn't to make fun of anybody. They genuinely don't know. A lot of people don't know how the hobby works. Now, a lot of you stepping into the hobby, people might laugh at you. Hell, I was on the Discord a few nights ago and I made kind of a chuckle at somebody who was asking a very similar question and it wasn't to make fun of anybody. It's because we saw, thought the same thing. I was new too, I remember it. I asked the exact same question. So none of this is to ever be condescending. None of this is to ever make fun of you or laughing because we remember being in that exact same spot. And it's kind of a funny question to ask, but we are here to help. My channel is here to help. There's tons of channels here to help and we want to help you. This is the bed to a Creality Ender 3. This is a bed to a Creality CR10 Max. And as you can see, they're very different sizes. However, neither of them can print an Iron Man suit or a giant six foot sword in one shot. Through this video, I wanna take you through some of the programs and a little bit of the process I do to actually cutting up these bigger 3D prints to fit them on almost any 3D printer. This is not a settings tutorial, though I am gonna cover some settings in Cura, that is not the entire basis of the program. It is simply to show you what I look for when I cut the prints, what I look for in Cura when I'm arranging them, and maybe just a few small settings you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to when actually getting ready to print that. Let me start off by saying real quick that there are no best settings for a 3D printer. Those videos that unfortunately say best settings for an Ender 3, best settings for a CR-10S, they're a little clickbaity. And granted, I know some of my video titles might be a little clickbaity too, but there are no perfect settings for an individual printer. It all depends on so many factors that you guys need to start thinking about more. What brand filament are you using? Are you using Silks, TPU, or something else? Is the piece tall and unstable, or is it flat and steady? You're never gonna get a perfect print profile from somebody. You're never gonna get the perfect settings from somebody unless they live next door to you in the same temperature, climate, environment, and they're using the exact same filament on the exact same printer, and they're using and printing the exact same thing. So please try to move on from that and understand that you need to dial in everything yourself, but it's not that complicated anymore. So let's hop on the computer, let's get started, and I'll show you how to cut some of these bigger models up. Ho oh, ho, I know that intro is gonna ruffle some feathers, but... So this is the build plate on a Creality Ender 3. It's a little over 200 cubed and this will never fit. But fret not, some modelers are nice enough to even cut up the prints when they send them to you or when they release them, but even that might not be enough sometimes or they just might not do it. The first program I wanna show you guys is called Slicer. It's spelled with a three, it's really fun. Now, while it's not really the best slicing and 3D printing program, I call this more of a butcher's block. This program is just awesome for cutting X, Y, Z parts. It's very simple to use, you drop it in, load the part, and there it is. Now, this part was actually scaled down significantly. I'm not sure how it saved or why it saved, but we're gonna beef this back up and just go up there to scale and this will be proportional to what's actually in Cura. So if I scaled it up to 100% here, it's gonna be this 100% in Cura when you drop it in. Again, I'm not quite sure why it saves at 17% here, but it does. Anyway, so this is the whole sword and I wanna cut this down a little bit. First, the absolute first thing I always press when I drop something into Slicer is split. Now what split's gonna do, and it won't do anything here, it's actually gonna break the model apart if there's something to be broken apart. This is the faceplate on one of my Mark 85 Iron Man helmets. Now if I go here and hit split, it's automatically gonna remove anything it can. The iframe and the faceplate itself were actually two separate models that were meshed together. Now this would give you the option to print them separately, but then you need to remember that they might not fit back together perfectly. If I go and undo this, if you examine really close to the corners, you can see that it actually collides with the mesh. These are meshes actually interfering with each other. And now if I go and remove this, the iframe is gonna be a little bit bigger and it's gonna take a little bit more work to get in, into it. Now this isn't always the case, it depends on the model, it depends on the model significantly, but always be warned that if you go and split something, there is a non-zero chance that it might not fit back together properly, and this is why. And it just requires a little bit of sanding, a little bit of heating and warping. It's not the end of the world. So that's the absolute first thing I'll do in Slicer. And there's a similar um, function in Mesh Mixer that I'll show you later. But if it breaks up the part, if it breaks up the weapon or prop, this might actually let you print it in a much nicer way instead of making these really harsh cuts that you're gonna need to refuse. So that didn't work, we're gonna hit cut. Now, right off the bat, unclick show preview. Slicer isn't the newest program, it does run a little slow sometimes and it can slow down computers and some higher poly models can even make it crash. So if, it's, if that's the case for you, 
Uh, there's really not so many ways around that. Hopefully Mesh Mixer works for you. So this is showing me the part laying through the build plate and it's, it wants to show me where the cut is. Now, if you go through the XYZ, you're gonna see this little panel move where the cut's gonna be made. And this is what you wanna play with. This is what you wanna end up moving around. Now, we don't wanna cut the blade flat like that. Uh, that would really only fit on the new belt printer. We wanna cut this thing up into chunks. So we're gonna find the orientation that works for us. Now, say you know for a fact your printer's max height is 200 or 230. I never really max out. We'll, so for something like an Ender, we'll say the 200 millimeter is its max height. If we drag the slider all the way over, and this is 100% scale, this model is 1,735 millimeters long. What you could do is drag this all the way back, just type in 200, and that's going to give you a 200 millimeter part right there. You're going to want to select keep upper and lower and perform the cut. Now again, I'm not sure exactly why it's doing this with this part. This is a weird model, but it's one of the bigger ones that I have. So we're just gonna go ahead and ignore these little rods right here and just get rid of them. It left this part at 100% scale, but it shrank the other part back down to 19% scale. And we can even go as far as to kind of line that back up. It is a little tricky to align parts here in Slicer, but it's not the end of the world. And now we have that part that's cut. Sometimes you can go over here, export the STL that you have selected. Sometimes it doesn't cooperate. Just control delete the big part, export it, save it somewhere you know that you want to save it. We'll say cut one, done. Control Z or control undo, bring it back. Then you can delete the part you just cut out, scale the other one back up, and then you rinse and repeat, and we're gonna go and cut it again. We're gonna go select the x-axis unclick preview so it goes a little faster pump it up to 200 again and there's the next part and you can rinse and repeat this until you go through the model and you have all the parts you need when we get in a mesh mixer you're going to notice something this that slicer is refilling the front of the model some cutting programs don't do this automatically this is why i like slicer it does this without any other settings in it it just makes the cut fills it in and you can export it Mesh Mixer doesn't always do this, and even if you try to make it do it, it still sometimes doesn't do it. This is the chest plate to my Mark 85, and it's at a weird angle, it's a weird shape, and a weird size. But first, we're gonna hit split, and look at that, it actually pops out the arc reactor. So when you go and print this, now the arc reactor is not gonna be in there, so we're gonna keep that out. And when I go to cut this up, it's really doing it at kind of an odd angle, and maybe this isn't ideally how I wanna do this. You unfortunately can't make exactly precise rotations in a uh, slicer and kind of moving and arranging things as a li little primitive. You can make these 45 degree rotations and you can try to guesstimate, but the best way I figured out to do this is actually go into Cura, drop the part into Cura, whether it fits or not, go over to rotate, unselect snap rotation, and rotate it exactly to where you want it to be. I'm gonna try to make this as flat as possible. I like that for where it is. And then you're going to go up to file and you're going to export it and just make sure you save it as an STL file. And just like that, it's actually arranged in Slicer how it was arranged in Cura. Now, sometimes it might not translate well properly. Um, it, it, it can give you some errors if it's a really high poly file. So hopefully again, Mesh Mixer will help you. And now with the cut feature open, we can go ahead and start manipulating and looking around this model on how we actually want to cut it. Now, how I cut it on mine was simply by going along the, I believe the x-axis, maxing out the distance left to right, and then just dividing by two. 204.75. Now this is gonna give us a dead center cut in the model. And it, this might not be where you wanna make the cut, you might wanna arrange it somewhere else, but by doing some simple math, you can guarantee that you have it exactly where it needs to be. And in this case, since this is a perfectly mirrored model, we don't need to keep the left and right, we can just perform the cut. So now we have the piece cut, ready to actually put, be put back into Cura. And if we select it and kind of look down near the bottom, it's 204 by 291 by 94. This is still a little bit bigger than what an Ender 3 can handle, but how we can arrange it can actually help us with that. So let's export this, save it, get rid of cut one, and we'll make this Mark 85 half. And here it is back in Cura, looking really good on our Ender 3. Almost looks like it'll fit. So now if we center this, the other benefit of making these really brute force plane cuts is now we have a perfectly flat spot to print on, a nice stable spot that's not gonna give us weird supports or have to uh, make us add or remove supports. And it's a good thing to go here and turn on snap rotation because we know this was cut at a 90 degree angle. So if we rotate this 90 degrees, we know when we put it on the build plate, it'll be perfectly flat. So now we can lift this up all the way and it's not gonna snap back to the bed until we get it to fit. And look at that. 
Now half of the chest on the Mark 85 fits on an Ender 3. We have a perfectly flat, nice stable spot for adhesion. It's only using supports here in the arc reactor and it's using some back here. But if you know your printer well enough, this won't matter. This is when we can go over here and start playing with our settings. And again, settings are gonna vary heavily on what, depending on what you're actually printing. Quality is all up to you. Your infill, your density, your speed, all of that. What I wanna show you is your supports. Now, if you're printing really big and about to max out your build plate, you might not wanna print fast. You might wanna drop it down to a 40 or a 50, but if you're printing something really wide and stable, max, you know, you can go up a little bit higher and you're gonna learn your printer speeds. On my Ender, I would print this at like a 60 or 70, where smaller prints, I've done 90 and 100 and it's come out just fine. So our support overhang is at 60. Now, if we go ahead and drop this down to like a 45, and this is kind of a stock setting in Cura, it's gonna wanna add supports in all these weird spots. I know, I know for a fact I don't need supports there. So let's jump that up to a 70, and it's still trying to add supports up here. So let's go ahead and slice this. And for stability, I always print with a raft. And you can change your raft margin for more stability. So let's change this to a 10. And you can see when I change it to a 10, it actually moves the border around my print. You can see this gray border increasing and decreasing. So let's make this a nine, let's make this an eight, and maybe a seven. Nope, doesn't wanna fit. So you're gonna have to play with this until it actually goes and fits, and it seems to be this corner over here that's giving us problems, and let's slice. 16 hours, 42 minutes, and we're gonna go over here to preview. Now, if you haven't changed your settings in preview, make sure you go and do this. You go up to this little pencil up here, and it might be material color, you wanna select line type and it's gonna give you everything that the printer is gonna actually put out. It's gonna give you all the different types. It's gonna give you what your infill looks like, it's gonna give you what your shell looks like, and it's gonna give you what your supports look like. So you can use this to go and see and evaluate, are your supports actually doing anything? So this is a good time to go and evaluate your print and start trying to see, all right, do we need that support there? Can I block that out? You can see right here that this isn't even touching as the print gets made. Now it can help with stability, but I know that these supports, as I move this, since they're not even touching or colliding, I might not really need that. However, you can see right here that this print is just starting in midair and that's never gonna work out. So this is when you wanna go back and forth and start trying to move and manipulate the print around to get it to print just a little bit better. So you can start doing something along the lines of rotating it forward a little bit, rotating it this way a little bit, spinning it around a little more, and doing your best to get it to not need supports in that area. So let's go ahead and try that again. So now we can see these supports are definitely doing nothing. And as this builds, nothing's building in a weird midair area. So I can go here and actually block these supports out. And if I wanna block these supports out, you go down here, select the model, and over on the left, you'll actually see support blocker. And you're gonna wanna drop these cubes directly onto the red. But you don't need to drop multiple because then you can go back to scaling, select the cube itself, and you can scale the cube up so it blocks out that entire area. You don't need to drop multiple cubes. Rinse, repeat, slice again. So just like that, we were able to shave off just a little bit of time, save a little bit of material, and if you know your printer well enough, that it's gonna survive. So it's not that bad, big of a deal. And again, I can go back and forth, play with this, manipulate it more. I could probably even get rid of this, this support requirement up here. And if we go up and look at it, typically when it starts adding these purple zigzags, it is supporting, it is actually taking some of that weight and bearing, and they are gonna be a little bit more required than the other ones that we deleted. So these ones, you gotta be really careful about getting rid of them. It all really does help with the structure and the actual full support of the model. Now, say you have a model like this where you wanna make a cut, but Slicer isn't giving you the angles that you want, and you're just kind of sick of exporting and importing them back and forth. I just printed this Mark 49 helmet, and I wanted to make a cut right here on the jaw. So we're gonna actually go into the next program, Mesh Mixer, and this is kind of a step up to Slicer, and it's gonna give you more freedom to make these really weird wide-angled cuts and have a lot more dimensionality with your parts. And you, can be, and you can feel free to completely use this one all on your own and never have to use Slicer, but you will see that some of them have benefits versus the other. So now we're a Mesh Mixer, and Mesh Mixer wasn't really made for 3D printing. It can just be good for manipulating 3D models. The first thing we wanna go to do is edit, and again, we're going to want to hit separate shells. This is the same thing as the split function in Slicer. No shells found, so we're kind of SOL there. One thing I like to do is generate face groups because this shows the colors and the areas and gives you a little bit more depth of field when looking at the model. And the big thing we're going to want to do is make a plane cut. 
Now this is just like the one in Slicer. However, now what we can do is we can pick exactly where we want it to go. And I wanna cut it right here. It's gonna move it down. And then with this, you can rotate it. And as you're rotating it, you can see how many lines are there. While you're holding it, you can hit up and down on the arrows and it'll add higher angles that you can lock and it'll give you a little bit more freedom to move things around. So I wanna move it about here and it's gonna show you where it won't cut. So this is a good view to kind of look at it so you'll see exactly what it's cutting through. If I start to move it down too much, you can see right here, it starts to hit the chin. So I wanna move it up, but I don't wanna go through that detail line and we can move it exactly there. And that's where I wanna make the cut. Now you can have a few options up here. Cut, discard half, slice, keep both, slice groups. I slice and keep both. And if we do no fill and hit accept, I wanna show you what this'll do. So now it's still the same model and we're gonna go back to separate shells and it's gonna break them up. So now we can see these ones and we can turn the visibility off. And what it did is it, it left the top and bottom layers so these are just these kind of remnants. We can delete, get rid of those, and we can look back at the helmet. Now, if we select this and look inside of it, you can see that it didn't fill in the model. This might be a problem when trying to print. So what you're gonna wanna do is go back. You can just Control Z, undo the whole cut, get rid of it. There it is. So we're gonna select remeshed fill, do the same thing, separate the shells, and let's just delete, I don't know, we'll delete, the ch we'll delete the chin. And if we look here now, you can see that it was refilled and it's printable, exactly what Slicer did without having to do some selections. But in Slicer, you can't make these really weird cuts and you don't have as much control over the function. And it's definitely not as smooth as Mesh Mixer. This is how I cut a lot of my armor parts up. This is how I cut a lot of my helmets up and you get those weird angles. Now there are other programs that can make more precise cuts and you can buy uh, more advanced programs, but these are the ones I use and they've served me very well um, for now. And you just gotta have to play with them. You can make any cuts with these. So this is the handle of my new jaw blade. And there's a little tutorial on how to do this in that video, but I wanna make this all inclusive. So we're gonna add a tube to it. First thing I wanna do, generate face groups, just so I can see with a little bit of color and that looks better. Now we're gonna go to this cool function called add a tube. And you can see that it's a crossed, uh, I don't know what axis it is, uh, relative to the model, but you're gonna really wanna leave everything alone. You're gonna wanna change the direction. So you see your X, this is the X axis. You have your Y, that's what we're gonna want, and your Z. So we're gonna go back to our Y axis because we want the tube to go all the way through. And you're gonna then go and move these dots around. So the first dot down here is where it's actually going to go. And this is where the, the tube is gonna start. So we want the tube to go right through the handle and you can play with this. So we'll center this best we can. I like right there, that looks pretty good. So that's where the tube's gonna be. And this other dot is how high it goes up. Now you can drag this all the way up if you want and you can make this go through the entire model and that'll put a tube directly through it. But I wanna stop the tube just a little bit before that because I don't, I don't want it capped off in the end. Now, depending on if what the size rod you're adding, this is radius. This is the radius of the hole. Usually when you measure metal rods or dowels, it's diameter. So if I wanna add a 10 millimeter rod, I need a five millimeter radius. So make sure you're doing your math right. This is exactly what I use. I use 10 millimeter metal threaded rods. So I have a five millimeter diameter and you can play with this all you want. And then you hit accept and it's gonna cut the rod out. And if we look here from the bottom, you'll see that there's now a hole added and I didn't quite get it centered. You're gonna have to play with that. It's not the end of the world. And what's also cool is now that that hole is there, if I go ahead and make a plane cut, it'll cut it with the hole there. So any parts I remove, it'll still now have that in the model. So you can play with this to add supports and structures. And I know there's programs like Lubin and other ones that can add pegs and stuff. I'm not personally a fan of the peg system. I can never get them to work properly, especially if your dimensional accuracy is not perfect. This works good for me, I'm happy with it. And as you can see, it's worked pretty good for the giant swords I've made so far. And some modelers are even nice enough to include these holes and tell you, hey, I made a channel for an eight millimeter rod or whatever the hell it might be. So the last trick I wanna show you guys is something kind of neat that I discovered in Slicer. And it might not be a big revelation, but say you get a model that's already cut into a bunch of pieces and you don't want those cuts to be there. You wanna rebuild the model and make bigger cuts. Say it was cut for something like an Ender 3, but you do have a CR10 Max. You don't need to print these tiny little pieces. You wanna do something a little bit bigger, right? In Slicer, if you actually go up here into settings or preferences, 
and unselect auto align X, Y, and Z and hit okay. I, I already have the full blade. I know that for a fact, this file came with it. However, say, and this doesn't always work, and I need to stress that this might not always work. It really depends on how it was modeled and how it was, it was saved. But it's again, it's worth knowing in case it does help you. And this has helped me a few times, especially when rebuilding Iron Man helmets. Now, auto align X, Y, and Z with them on, if I start dropping parts into here, they're gonna go right to the build plate. It's gonna auto align them and nothing's really gonna make sense. This is no fun, this isn't what we want. So we're gonna delete them all. We're gonna go up here to preferences again, unselect it, and then we're gonna drop a part in. And then we're gonna drop a part in, and again, and again. And you can see that the save file for each part actually remembers its 3D um, telemetry. It remembers where it was in the 3D scape when it was actually exported, which is kind of awesome, I think. So you can use this to rebuild the file and they'll line up in such a way, as long as it was modeled and cut right, where you can go and export this entire STL now and you have the blade rebuilt. And if you export it and drop it back in, now it's one full STL file you can make your own cuts for. And I believe if you go back and hit split again, yes, it will break it back up and then you can control Z it, undo it. And now you have a full model. Like I've said, I've used this to actually rebuild helmets when I wanted to print a larger part of it. I can actually do this to rebuild my Mark 85 helmet in real time and line everything up where it wants to be and have a fully assembled helmet, export that STL, or maybe just delete the faceplate and export this as one solid helmet and print it. So this way they'll print and fuse together. And you can play with this on full suits. You can play with this on swords, weapons, wherever you want to actually apply this to. And it's just a, it's a it's kind of like a reverse engineering trick you can do. But again, it doesn't always work. There's a lot of um, Thingiverse helmets and just a lot of other files that just, just won't apply to. So you might get lucky, you might not. And real quick before we close this out, I just want to show you guys some of the things I use to fuse the parts together, especially when you're making these bigger cuts and you need to print something like a big old helmet or a big old Iron Man suit. My favorite technique is the soldering iron, actually taking a soldering iron and melting the plastic bits back together. And even though it looks a little bit like dookie sometimes with some sanding and some wood filler, you can get them to look pretty good. I cut off the bottom of the faceplate for the Mark 49 and the same thing I did with that jaw that I just showed you. Now you can get really good at plastic welding and I have a tutorial on that, but the more time you put into it, you can start to get them perfect, really, really smooth and not need a lot of filling to fix it. But if you do have to actually go and fill them in, and I'm gonna probably put a little bit there, I already put a little bit there. In my mind, wood filler is the best. Now you'll see people use Bondo, you'll see people use Spot Putty. I feel like they're just too expensive for what you're doing. The wood filler dries in a few minutes, it sands away way easier and it's super cheap. This is like $2 for this whole tube and it'll last you a while. If I can't always use the soldering iron, like certain parts of this Gundam model or certain parts of the like giant swords, you do need to use some super glue. Now I don't particularly like normal super glue. I use Miterbond Cyanoacrylate and it comes in a bunch of different brands, but it's CA glue. It has a glue and an activator. You put the glue on one side, you put the activator on the other and it bonds really strong. And that's holding a lot of these together where I can't get the soldering iron. So it definitely does help. And if you take some super glue and some baking soda, you can make basically a rock. I know that kind of sounds weird, but if you drop super glue on this stuff, it turns it into like a crystal rock form and you can use that to fill in gaps. It is a little bit harder to sand, but it is very strong. And it's also just a little neat little model or trick to kind of have into your arsenal. And why do I use a soldering iron instead of a 3D pen? While a 3D pen is really good for filling in areas, it has no penetration. When I had to go and weld the line here, and, and I didn't do the best uh, time filling it in, you can still see where some of it was. In parts in here, though the, though the 3D pen could have filled in the line and made it look a lot better, there's nothing in terms of penetration. What I was doing for my buster sword and what I did for seams along the sword is you can actually bury the soldering iron into the print and start to take some leftover material and melt it in and get a nice strong structure. And then you could use something like a 3D pen to fill and smooth in the surface. But if you want a nice strong bond with the plastic, this is how I do it. I just will bury the, the, the iron into it, make sure the insides are actually melted together where the two surfaces collide and it's much stronger. Sometimes I'll just use some super glue if it's not gonna get a lot of abuse, but if you're printing something really big like this, you're gonna want all the adhesion you can possibly get. And sometimes glue isn't the best thing for that.
I know that was a long one, guys. I just really wanted to get one kind of master video of all my tips and tricks and the things I use to build these larger props. And hopefully this can be just that quick reference I can send you guys when you're asking all of those questions. So I do appreciate it if you did watch the whole thing and hopefully there was some information in there. Even if you've been printing for a little bit, maybe I taught you something new. But if you know people who are struggling with this and they can benefit from this video, please send it to them. If you guys haven't already, if you could subscribe, that'd be really awesome. I do have more videos like this. I am going to be touching more on settings for the next couple of weeks. It is the holidays. There are a lot of new people coming into the 3D printing scape, and I want to make sure I get all the information I can out there to help them along. And also, if you're new to the channel, I do implore you, look around. I do have settings tutorials. I do have a bunch of 3D printing and cosplay tutorials that I'm sure could benefit you guys, especially if you're starting out. If you guys have any comments, questions, concerns, you want to know more, you want to know more about something I did in the background or elaborate on something else, please leave a comment down below or hit me up on Instagram. I got my Instagram back. Thank you, everybody who helped me out there. I was freaking out, and I really appreciate it. I'm so glad it's back, but that's a problem for later. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for everything, and you have a good day.